I want to welcome you all back to the uh, Live Better series. It's always an honor, really deeply an honor, to spend this time with you each week and talk about important topics that, for so many of us, as we've learned about these topics and we've integrated them into our lives, it's helped us make some positive changes in our lives and actually live better. And that, of course, is the title of the series, is Living Better live better. And of course, we apply the principles of acceptance and commitment therapy, as well as the principles of logotherapy, and taking a look at how we can all live a more vital and meaningful life. A couple of weeks ago, the topic that we talked about was forgiveness. How can we forgive others who have harmed us? And I think that was a really good class that we did together. Today we're going to revisit the other side of that topic and, and, and the topic today is how can we forgive ourselves and it turns out the way that we can forgive ourselves is by taking responsibility and making amends to those people that we have harmed. And so that's what we're going to walk through is how are the ways that we harm other people? Um, how can we go about taking a look at what's called like an examination of conscience? How can we take a look at what was going on with us when we harm someone. And then we're going to take a look at what are the eight steps, the eight steps that we can walk through to make amends so that we take full responsibility for how we've harmed someone. In the process, we can forgive ourselves and we can heal ourselves from guilt. And to a certain extent, we can also heal ourselves from shame. So we're gonna be talking about making amends, taking responsibility, and healing our guilt. And one of the most important things for us to remember throughout this talk today is that we're all human. We all make mistakes. We're all human. And if we're out there and we're, we're living our life, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to do the wrong thing. We're going to make poor decisions based on fear or hurt or defensiveness or some other shortcoming or character defect because we're human. And so we're going to do things that hurt our spouse, our significant other, our dad, our mom, our brothers, our sisters, our children, our friends, people in our support <coughs> groups. We're going to, somehow we're going to make mistakes and we're going to harm someone that we know or that we care about. And so, that's the first thing that we want to just admit is that we're human. We're going to make errors and that's okay. And then using that as a foundation, then what do we do with that? Well, where we go with that is that we, knowing that it's okay to be human, knowing that we feel bad when we've harmed someone, but that we want to take responsibility and get back to that person and admit that we made a mistake and how are they doing it. So, so we want to have that level of humanness as well. One of the things that happens when we make mistakes, sometimes because of our pride or our fear, or because we feel guilt or shame, we hide or we cover up. That's what shame is. Shame is about covering up, isn't it? And guilt as well. Sometimes we, oh, no, I didn't do that. So we want to deny, we want to rationalize, we want to cover up. Or sometimes we want to blame the people that we've harmed. We might want to blame them and say, well, if you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have done this. So it's really your fault. You're responsible for how I behaved. Because it, it's not easy to take responsibility. There are a lot of great philosophers and psychotherapists throughout the, the history of the world who have pointed out that as human beings, it's normal that we do things that hurt other people it's also very normal that we try to cover up or we try to explain away why we did this so that we don't have to take full responsibility for what we've done. Now, when we do that, when we cover up and we don't take responsibility for how we've harmed ourselves or someone else, what happens is we diminish our own humanity. We diminish our own humanity. That's why sometimes when we harm someone, and we don't take full responsibility for what we've done, our self-esteem suffers because we're not stepping up to the plate. We don't step up. 
and admit, yes, I did that, and I'm really sorry that I did that. And we're going to walk through the steps today. But we diminish ourselves when we don't take full responsibility. So the great psychiatrist and philosopher Viktor Frankl said, when we do something to harm someone and we take on the full responsibility of admitting it, I, I admit that I've done something to harm you and I'm sorry. And we walk through those eight steps. He said, when we take on the full responsibility, we ennoble ourselves as human beings. We're saying, you know what? I have the nobility of a human being to admit in my humanity, yes, I erred. Again, based on my fear or my hurt or my defensiveness or other shortcomings. And I take full responsibility for what I have done to harm you. So rather than harming our self-esteem, Dr. Frankel points out that we ennoble ourselves in our self-esteem when we do take responsibility. And instead of covering up, we, we throw those covers down and we take full responsibility. So Dr. Frankel points out, if we're really healthy, we will accept the guilt. We'll, we'll listen to the guilt. Instead of covering it up, we'll listen to it. And then we'll take the responsibility of making amends. Now, it's important to distinguish here when we're talking about guilt to know that there's unhealthy guilt as well. And unhealthy guilt is where I feel guilty about something that I'm really not responsible for. Like sometimes children growing up in families, if there's a divorce, they somehow feel guilty that their parents are getting a divorce. Or they can feel guilty that their dad or their mom is an alcoholic or a drug addict. Or they can feel guilty that a sibling is not doing well in school. So that's really kind of an emotional and psychological, really kind of an existential boundary issue, huh? That we want to take responsibility for what we're responsible for, and that's healthy guilt. But neurotic guilt is where we feel guilty for things that we have no reason to feel guilty for that. We're really not responsible for that. So I want you to be thinking about that today when we're walking through this, to think about that boundary issue. And if you're feeling some guilt come up, and just like in the forgiveness talk a couple of weeks ago, we talked about when we're talking about this issue of forgiveness, it's normal that different thoughts and feelings come up and maybe thoughts and feelings that are painful or difficult or we'd rather push underwater like that beach ball and run away from them. So during this talk, just like we did with the forgiveness talk, if you're feeling guilt or shame or these questions that you're struggling with come up, go ahead and let them come up and let, them, let your thoughts and feelings and your questions be there. That's healthy. Don't go pushing them down. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So when we don't make excuses and we don't say, yeah, but, and we don't say, yeah, like the Flip Wilson defense, how huh? the devil made me do it, we don't get, it, get into that defense and we take full responsibility, then we're being fully human and fully alive. Now, from the perspective of, of ACT therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and you'll remember those of you that have been to our other classes, this is our little ACT cheat sheet. This is our little anchor, and it reminds us of the key principles of ACT therapy. And so the first principle is, like, is the big bluebird of happiness. And that is that the idea that all of us were born to live a vital and meaningful life. That's kind of our heritage, to live a vital and meaningful life. And we can live a vital and meaningful life even in those days or those eras of our life when we are feeling physically ill or we're feeling depressed or anxious, we can still live a vital and meaningful life. Now, some of the things that are important for us to be able to live that kind of life are, first of all, this, these glasses here, huh? These glasses that one of the things that we realize is I need a new pair of glasses. I need to be willing to start to look at life in a new way. And of course, that's one of the key purposes of this group, is to take a look at things for your consideration and see if there are one or two things in the class today that might help you put on a new pair of glasses when you're looking at this topic of guilt and shame and personal responsibility and freedom as well. The other symbol that's really important is the little beach ball. And you'll remember with the beach ball, we'll talk about sometimes when difficult thoughts or feelings start coming up, we push them underwater like a beach ball. It's like, I don't want to have to deal with this. And of course, the more pressure we put on that beach ball, eventually it comes up because our arms get too weak trying to hold it down, don't they? 
Huh? Or we end up getting into maladaptive coping, trying to keep that down. So it's really healthy in our best interest to be mindful and take some deep breaths and let these thoughts and feelings come up and learn how to tolerate difficult thoughts and feelings. And as we learn to tolerate difficult thoughts and feelings, the other thing that comes up with the beach ball is that part of us that's healthy and saying yes to life and is really attracted to the good things in life. We've been pushing that down along with the difficult things. We've been pushing down that say yes to life part of ourselves as well. Now, as we let the beach ball come up, the next symbol that's important are the finger traps. And so we talk about with the finger traps that we can, the more we resist what is, the more we trap ourselves. So we learn to accept our thoughts and feelings and accept people, places, and things outside of ourselves that that is the way it is and I am the way I am. So rather than struggling against ourselves the way we are, and that doesn't mean we don't want to change, but changing ourselves always starts with accepting myself, accepting ourselves as we are today. Then we go from there. So instead of struggling against ourselves or struggling against people, places, and things and saying, I don't want to be this way or I don't want them to be this way, we ease into it and we accept that. And when we do that with the Chinese finger traps, then we free ourselves instead of trapping ourselves. So it's a vital life. It's a new perspective. It's letting our thoughts and feelings come up. It's not struggling against what is. Then the next thing we look at is Nike therapy one, two, three. Nike therapy one, two, three. And that is what are my top three values? What kind of a person do I want to be? Do I want to take responsibility? Do I want to be forgiven? Do I want to forgive? Do I want to be a loving person? Do I want to be free? Do I want to be healthy? Do I want to be my best self? What are my values? Then Nike therapy is not just wishing it or thinking about it, but actually doing it like Nike therapy. Just do it, huh? So from that then, let's take a, a closer look at our topic today. And that is, so if you turn to this page right here, and it starts off with a quote, one of the most profound offerings of a human being. And it talks about how taking responsibility and apologizing and making amends is one of the most profound things we can do as human beings. It heals up broken relationships. It can free us up from our guilt and shame. It can also free the other person up, the person that we have harmed. Right underneath that, you can see there's a list of the 17 most frequent ways that we human beings harm each other. So as I walk through that, why don't you just check in with yourself and see that, well, yeah, have I done that or have I done that recently or have I done in the, that in the past? So one of the ways that we harm each other as human beings is that we betray a trust. huh? We betray the trust of a parent, a significant other, of a child. The next one is we break, a, we break a promise. The next one is we deceive someone. We lead them along. We don't tell them the whole truth. Or we can abuse someone emotionally, verbally, physically, sexually. We can be neglectful. So someone needs us and requires our attention and we neglect them. Gossiping about other people is a way that we harm people, isn't it? And then right along with gossiping, another is slander. When we're tearing down someone's reputation in front of other people, that's a way that we harm other human beings, isn't it? The next one listed is if we break a confidence. Somebody says, I need to share something with you. I don't want it to go any further, but I feel like I can trust you. I need to share this with you and they share it with us and then we break that confidence and we tell someone else. Another one is where we create a negative or toxic environment, either where we live with our family or where we work or in our church or our support groups, by the way we behave and the way we talk, we bring a certain negativity or toxicity to that environment instead of optimism and goodwill and love. Another one is being mean or being cruel. 
The next way that we want to take a look at is sometimes in our worst moments, we can be manipulative of other people or we can exploit them for our, our own purposes, can't we? So again, as we're going through this, just kind of check in with yourself. And again, if you're having certain thoughts or feelings come up, either because you're going, oh my gosh, I didn't maybe realize I was really doing this or gosh, I really was harming someone. Or maybe as we're talking about this, it's coming up for you where someone else may have done this to you and, and you're thinking about that issue about how you've been hurt and maybe you need to forgive someone who's done this to you. So the next way that we're taking a look at is, is stealing from someone, taking something from someone else that's not ours. Maybe we can humiliate another person or we, we're disrespectful to them in front of other people, again, at church, in the workplace. Maybe we're unfair. We all know one of the, one of the studies that, that is, that's been done with little kids that are like one or two years old. Little kids one or two years old, they know what fair is. And they know when somebody's not being fair. And we know that too, huh? When in, in, in our churches, in our workplace, where we're treating someone unfairly or we're being treated that way or we see someone else treating other people unfairly. So what do we do about that? Another way that we can harm other people is if we falsely accuse them of something. Another way is denigrating someone else's beliefs. So here when we're talking about beliefs, we're talking about where someone holds something really close to their heart. It's really important to them. Maybe it's a philosophical belief or it's a religious belief or it's a spiritual belief or it's a belief about their own self-esteem or their family and we put them down like, how can you believe that? What kind of an idiot believes something like that? So we, we, we tear something precious away from someone else, something that they really believe in. And then the last one that we have listed is violating someone else's privacy reading their emails, reading their text, listening in on a conversation that, that we really shouldn't be listening in on. It's a conversation between two other people and we realize there's an element of privacy, but we, we kind of snoop on that conversation. So, so as we've just gone through this list, these are the 17 most frequent ways that us human beings, that we, we can harm one another. And since all of us here in this room are human, probably, all of us here have done at least one or two of these or maybe several of these in the course of our lives, huh? So if we identify that, yes, I've done this, then the next question is, in other words, I've harmed someone based on this behavior. The next question we ask ourselves is, have I made amends to them? Have I gone back to that person and made direct amends to them? Or is it still hanging out there 10 years later 10 months later, 10 days later, 10 minutes, is it still hanging out there? And it's interfered in my relationship with them or it's affecting me with guilt or shame. And we're going to go through that in a minute. So let's go ahead and take a look at these eight major questions here. So if, if something has come up for us that maybe we have perpetrated some harm against another human being. So one, this is a worksheet that you can use, okay? So the first question is, who did I harm? And we would write down, well, I harmed my dad or my mom or my brother, my sister, my spouse, my stepchild, my child, my friend, my coworker, my patient. How, who did I harm? Then the next, we write down, how did I harm that person? And it's probably one of these 17 things. It could be some other things, but this is what happened. This is what I did where I harmed that person. Now, again, we're being really honest here, huh? Instead of like, instead of like glancing in the mirror and turning away with these questions, we're having the courage to look directly in the mirror. We're looking at ourselves and saying, yes, this is the truth about me and the truth about what happened, okay? So number two, we just ask our, we've, we're writing down, well, what happened? What exactly did I do with my dad or my mom or my spouse or my ex-spouse, my brother, my sister, my kid? So the next question, number three is, do I feel guilty about what I did? So 
we want to check in with our interior selves. How am I feeling about this? Do I feel guilty that I did this or not? I will say this again, like for Dr. Frankel said, when we harm someone and we feel guilty, that's a good, healthy trait that ennobles us. The kind of people that do things to hurt other people and they don't feel guilty, I don't think we want those kinds of qualities, huh? Those are called people that are antisocial, psychopathic, sociopaths, people that have no empathy. They can harm someone and they could care less about it. So it's really good and healthy if we can let that beach ball come up and say, you know what? I do feel guilty about what I said or what I did. The next question is, how is my guilt affecting me? Guilt, so we're all whole human beings, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially. And something like guilt affects all of those dimensions. So we want to stop and say, well, is my guilt affecting my sleep? Is it affecting my gastrointestinal tract? Is it affecting my heart? Do I end up eating for comfort and I end up with diabetes or an eating disorder? Do I turn to alcohol or drugs to press that guilt or that shame down to make it go away? That's one of the things we do at the beach ball, huh? Is, is it affecting me in terms of worry? Is the fact that I harmed someone and I've never made it up to them, is it causing me to feel depressed? Does it make me feel anxious? Do I feel, end up feeling ashamed of myself? Do I feel divorced from my family or my community or my, my peer group? Do I feel kind of like divorced from my higher power? Do I feel disconnected because of my shame? Is it affecting my self-esteem? So we want to write that down. Like, what is the cost to me? Not that I've harmed someone, but that I've harmed someone and I haven't gone back to them and made it up to them. What's that costing me? Then the next one is, and those are similar questions, do I feel ashamed of myself that I harm someone? So shame is, I'm a bad person. Guilt is, I did a bad thing. Those are the differences. Guilt is, I did something bad. I did something that harmed somebody. Shame is, I'm a bad person because I did this. So sometimes we feel both of those things. Am I feeling ashamed of myself? And then how is that affecting me? And probably the same as one of those ways that we just walk through, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially. Number five, we want to ask ourselves, what, what was I doing that led me to behave this way? Where I betrayed someone, or I, I put them down in front of other people, or I gossiped about them, I slandered, or I stole. This is where we're trying to understand ourselves. And we're also trying to have some empathy for ourselves. What was going on with me? Like, was I loaded? Was I high? Was I broke? Was I homeless? Was I hypomanic? Was I bipolar manic? Was I severely depressed? Was I paranoid at the time? Was I really on edge and I felt, you know, what was going on with me that I behaved that way? And again, we're not trying to come up with any excuses here, but we're wanting to, we're wanting to learn from this experience, right? And, and maybe if we learn from this experience, we won't repeat it over again. So what was going on with me that I did this? Number six, how would my life be better if I had the courage to go back to that person and make amends? Might I sleep better? Might my depression lessen a little bit? Maybe do I think my anxiety might be less? It might not be so oppressive. Might I stay sober? Might I be less attracted to use drugs to change the way that I feel? Might I feel more connected to that person or to my family or church or my peer group again? Might I feel more connected because I've relieved myself of this burden of guilt and my shame? Might I feel more connected to, to my higher power and to life? So what, what are some of the ways that my life might be better? That would be an incentive, see? Why would I want to do this? 
And so we always want to think about that. What do we want to avoid? Like how can we, what can we do to relieve ourselves of these negative symptoms? And on the other hand, what can I do that will enhance my life, make my life better? Number seven asks us, okay, now that you've thought about this, for some of these things, these are really big issues. Like if we've really harmed someone and we're, we have some trepidation and maybe we, we don't exactly know how to go about this because we haven't done this before. We haven't tackled something really big like this before. And so here, here's a list of some, do we have a confidant that we need to talk to, to like, or a counselor or a therapist or a priest or a minister or a rabbi? Someone that we can talk about this and get some direction and kind of relieve ourselves of this guilt and shame and also get some help and some support where they might say, well, why don't you try this or why don't you do that? Also, some other resources that are listed, sometimes journaling can help. Going back and really writing about what happened. Sometimes writing a letter to that person. Now, we, I'm not suggesting you write the letter and send it. But I'm saying writing the letter like dear dad or dear mom or dear ex-spouse or dear stepson or stepdaughter or son or daughter. I just need to relieve my heart to you. I want to tell you what was happening. And so we write it all out. All this stuff that we've been pushing underwater all these years with that beach ball, huh? So writing a letter can be helpful along with journaling. Some people find it helpful to pray about this to their to God or to their higher power. Some people find it helpful to meditate. So those are some resources that can help you walk through yourself. Now again, this, as we're talking about this, in some cultures, this would be called a cleansing experience, right? Because when we've harmed someone and we're guilty and ashamed, we do feel kind of, we do feel dirty, don't we? We feel dirty. We don't feel as good as we might feel. So when we, we, we take responsibility and we have the courage to face this and then we go back to this person and we walk through these eight steps I'm going to go through with you in a minute, we feel free and we feel clean. We feel good. We can look ourselves in the mirror. And we still might feel bad about what we did, but we can look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what, I feel good about myself. I had the courage to take responsibility. I stepped up to the plate here. So having gone through these seven steps, if we say, yes, you know what, I would like to have, I would like to take full responsibility for what I did. And I do want to have the courage to go ahead and talk to this person and make amends. Now it's important to remember that amends is not an apology. Saying I'm sorry is one thing, but that's only part of this whole scenario of making amends. And so through the work that I've done as a therapist for the last 40 years, I've developed these eight steps that we can walk through to make amends to those that we have harmed. And that's under number eight here. So the first thing that we want to do is we, on, we look in the mirror, we honestly admit and we say, you know what? I really did harm this person. I did it. No excuses, no ifs, ands, or buts. Yes, I did it. I did something that harmed them. Number two, again, this is like the letting the beach ball up. Number two, we allow ourselves to feel sadness that any normal human being feels and to feel remorse when we realize what we did to hurt one of our children, a spouse, a friend, a parent, a brother, a sister, a coworker. It's like, wow, I feel really sad. I feel bad. We allow ourselves to feel that. That's part of the healing process, you guys, to allow ourselves to feel that. Feeling that too will also help us to not repeat the same mistake. Because when we're tempted to repeat the same mistake and we remember how bad it felt, a little alarm goes off and says, remember, don't do that. Remember how bad you felt last time. This is like the school of hard knocks. This is our, our PhD in the school of hard knocks. So we allow ourselves to feel that. Number three, the next thing we, deci we decide to forgive ourselves. 
So we take responsibility. We feel what we need to feel in terms of sadness or regret or remorse. Then we say to ourselves, I am making the decision to forgive myself for what I did. Now, we, we don't know if that other person's going to forgive us or not. That's really their business, whether or not they do. But number th the third step is we say, I am going to forgive myself for what I did. I'm taking full responsibility, and I also forgive myself. Number four, we're getting ready to go talk to that person about what happened. So before we go talk to them, we forgive them if they've ever done anything to harm us. Because, you know, there's that saying about you always hurt the ones you love the most. So usually the people that we, have, we owe the strongest amends to are people that are closer to us. And because they are closer to us, probably they've done some things that have hurt us too because they're human beings too, right? So one of the biggest mistakes we can make is saying, okay, I'm taking responsibility and I'm going to go talk to my dad or my mom or my brother, or my sister, whoever, and I'm going to tell, talk to them about how I harmed them. But in the back of our minds, we're saying, and they're going to tell me that they're sorry for what they did, huh? We don't know if they're going to say they're sorry. They may not. So before we even get there, we want to say, and you know what? As I'm getting ready to go talk to my dad or my mom, or my brother, or my sister, or my spouse, or my ex-spouse. I remember now everything they did to me that hurt me. This is why sometimes it's good to have a therapist, or a counselor, or a mentor, or a clergy person to really walk through this and talk about these things. Because step number four, before we go talk to them, we want to forgive them in advance for any harm they've ever done to us. So we want to forgive them in advance. So as far as we're concerned, they have a clean slate. Number five, we go to that person and we tell them specifically, I am sorry specifically for what I did to you. So we don't say sorry. I'm sorry for what I did back in 1995. We don't know. I'm sorry for what happened at Thanksgiving. Remember, it was like Thanksgiving back in the, I don't know. But you know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry about that. No, we're really specific. This is part of the healing process for us. It's also part of the healing process for the other person. I am really sorry for what I said to you at Thanksgiving dinner in 2001 when everybody was sitting around. We were having dessert and everybody was laughing and joking and I brought up what happened to you back in high school. And I know it humiliated you in front of everybody. And some of those people never even knew that it happened. And I'm really sorry that I brought that up. And I could tell you were red in your face. And you got up and walked away. And I felt bad. But it's taken me this long to get back to you and apologize to you that I can't tell you how bad I feel that I brought that up in front of everybody else in the family. And I can't tell you how bad I feel that for all these years, I've never gotten back to you and apologized to you about this. So we bring that up very specifically, huh? I'm very sorry for what happened to you when we were co-workers last year. Or we were in that group therapy together and we were students together. Or what, I'm very sorry for what I said or what I did that harmed you. I know it harmed you. So we're very specific. We acknowledge that we harmed them. Now, you can, we don't bring it up, though, if it's going to hurt somebody all over again. Or we don't bring it up if somebody doesn't know that we did something to harm them. Sometimes it may do more harm. Like, again, the, we have to look into our own heart. And we need to decide what we're going to do. But sometimes, like in, in a marriage, if a spouse has been unfaithful and they've cheated on their spouse but the spouse doesn't know it, we might decide we're going to make amends by remaining faithful in our relationship, but it would harm my spouse even more if I brought this up to her or to him and told them about what happened last year or five years ago. That might just do them unbelievable harm, and it's better to let sleeping dogs lie. Now again, sometimes it's better to bring it up 
This is why it's good to have a good therapist or priest or minister or mentor to talk to, to sort this out like, what should I do? I want to do the right thing, but what should I do? The other thing is, like if someone doesn't know that we've harmed them, let's say that we realize that we've been spreading gossip or rumors or slander to everybody else in our class or our church or our support group or our 12-step group. And maybe they don't even know it. And to bring this up, to tell, tell everybody, to go back to that person and say, I want you to know I've been telling everybody about Maybe it's better to say, you know what, the way of doing that is to go back to those other people and say, you know what, I was a dirty rat for saying that about so-and-so. And I want to take that back either because it's not true or I shouldn't have said it. And I apologize. I did the wrong thing. But maybe we don't go back to that person because it would mortify them terribly to know that we've been gossiping or slandering about them. Now, again, though, sometimes we do need to go back and talk to them these are all very delicate things and they're all individual. And so sometimes that's why, again, why it's good to have a mentor, a psychotherapist, a clergy person to talk to about these things. Another thing is timing. We want to bring it up at the right time. Sometimes it's better to not bring this up right after we've harmed someone. It's better to maybe let them cool down a little bit and then go back to them and, 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 go and t say, hey, I, I want to talk with you. I want to make amends to you for what I did. Um, number six. So we've already apologized. All right, I'm really sorry for what I did. We're real specific. Number six. We say to them, what can I do to make this up to you? So do you start, you see we're getting into territory that's beyond an apology, aren't we? To bring this full circle, we're not just apologizing. Now we're saying, what can I do to make this up to you? And we're aware, we take responsibility and say, unless this person says something that's really unreasonable, if they make a reasonable request, I'm going to take responsibility and make it up to them. So what can I do to make this up to you? Number seven, we tell the person I want you to know I will, I've learned my lesson and I will do my best to never do this again, this, this specific behavior that harmed you. I, I want you to know I will do my best to never do this again to either harm you or anyone else. I've learned my lesson. And then lastly, we ask them, can you find it in your heart to forgive me? So we're really making ourselves vulnerable, aren't we, with these last three things. So it's not just an apology and then we walk away. It's like I apologize and what can I do to make it up to you? I pr I've learned my lesson. I promise you I will do my best to never repeat this mistake and harm you or anyone else like this again. And now we're really vulnerable, aren't we? And we say, can you find it in your heart to forgive me? And we're standing there. And they might say, yes, I will forgive you. Or they might say, I'm sorry, I can't forgive you. But we have to live with that, don't we? We have to, and we don't try to convince somebody. We, we accept, we're vulnerable, and we accept what they tell us. Now, sometimes, just like my friends who, who uh, as doctors and nurses, or work in orthopedics, they'll tell me that when a bone, where a bone is broken, when it heals back, it's stronger than, than the way it was before. That same thing is true with relationships. When we go through these steps of making amends, relationships can be stronger than they ever have been before. So broken marriages, broken families, broken relationships, sometimes there can be a healing and the relationship is stronger than ever before. However, sometimes people will say, I forgive you, but I really don't want to have anything more to do with you. Or sometimes people might say, you know what? I can't forgive you. What you did was unforgivable. And as Dr. Frankel said, that's called existential guilt. We have to live with that. But at least we had the courage to go back and face that person rather than hiding under the covers and living with guilt and shame and all the negative consequences that we talked about earlier 
with sleeplessness and eating disorders and alcoholism and drug abuse and social isolation and low self-esteem. We, we can walk away from that interaction, you guys, and we can feel good about ourselves because we've taken responsibility. We've had the courage to do something that was really difficult to do. And we can feel free inside. And we can feel clean instead of dirty. We can feel clean and say, you know what? I did the right thing. I did the right thing. I faced up to what I needed to face up to. So as I, as I said at the beginning of our talk, as human beings, we're all, we're all whole people, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, existentially. We're all one, one whole person. And what we do physically affects our mind and our spirit. And what we do with our mind and our emotions and our spirit affects our body. This issue of making amends to people that we have harmed is a really important health issue. It's a really important holistic health issue. And I hope I've helped make that point today. That if we've harmed someone and we're not taking responsibility and courage to heal that, that we're really harming ourselves in every dimension of our life. I hope you've heard me say today that when we're willing to take responsibility and find the courage to, to make amends to those people that we have harmed, we are helping ourselves holistically. We are helping ourselves be healthier physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, and existentially. We're, we are helping ourselves along to lead a more healthy and vital and meaningful life. So as we're leaving out of this class today, as you know, I usually almost every class, I ask you to think about what was one thing that you got out of this class today that you can use? So stop and think about that for a minute. What's one thing that we talked about today as we walk through this outline today? And I know you were listening with your mind and with your heart and with your gut and with your experience. What's one thing that you can use today to live a more vital and meaningful life? Then the next thing is Nike therapy, to go ahead and do it, right? To follow up with what we know is best, to go ahead and do what's best. As always, it's been a great honor for me to spend this time with you. Thank you very much, and I wish you the very best.